Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salam wa sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsani la yawmiddin Alhamdulillahi ladhi hadana li hadha wa ma kunna li nahtadi lawla an hadana Allah Allahumma la ilmana illa ma alamtana inna kanta al-alimul hakim Allahumma alimna ma yunfa'ana wa anfa'ana bima alamtana wa zidna ilmana fikran fi dini ya Rabbil Alameen Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I would like to welcome you all to another session of Commentary on the 40 Hadith of Imam Nawi and the last session we introduced you to this course and we introduced you to these beautiful Ahadith. We talked about the importance of the Sunnah, we talked about the life of this great Imam and Muhaddith and how we are benefiting from the great Hadith which he collected along with the other scholars which were sort of part of this such as Ibn Salah and Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali and now we're actually going to step into the hadith the first hadith and do more in-depth commentary remember that we narrate the first hadith all the way back in its complete sanad back to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through a complete change of some of the most pious people who walked the face of the earth these were people who preserved the actions of the Prophet ﷺ. and alhamdulillah again this is just reflecting that this is a jaza course and we want to try to benefit as much as we can from it so let us begin and go over the the first hadith again an amir al-mu'minin abi hafs umr ibn khattab radiyu anhu qal sami'tu rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yakul inna ma la'malu bin niyat wa inna ma likul imrin ma nawa فَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ لِدُنْيَا يُسِيبُهَا أَوْ إِمْرَأَةٍ يَنْكِحُهَا فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى مَا حَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِ And the translation of this hadith, it is narrated on the authority of Amir al-Mu'mineen Abu Hafs Umar bin Khattab radiyu anhu who said, I heard the Messenger Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, Actions are judged or accepted by niyat. So each man will have what he intended. Thus he whose hijrah is for Allah and his messenger. Then his migration is for Allah and his messenger. But he whose migration is for some worldly thing that he might gain. Or for a wife that he may marry. Then his migration is for that which he migrated for. And this is in the narrated by the Imams, the two Imams of the Muhaddithin, Al Bukhari and Muslim, with their full names, as narrated by Imam Nawi Rahimullah. So, the tradition of the scholars in discussing a hadith, particularly the Muhaddithin, starts with a little synopsis about the narrator. And most of the hadith dars which I've listened to follow this tradition. We will do the same here since there are several benefits. Here, the hadith is narrated by none other than Amir al mumineen Abu Hafs. And you will notice that Imam al nawi starts by stating the full name of the narrator. This endows respect similar to how Imam Bukhari and Muslim were introduced at the end of the hadith with their full name and full title. So Amir al mumineen was the tal given to Umar during his Khilafah. Abu Bakr was called Khalifatul Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Abu Hafs it means that it's actually a nickname, a laqab, which is a title or respectable nickname given to Omar bin Khattab. And this is actually something which is praiseworthy, that you are called by your best names. Whether it is a true laqab, which is basically, for example, Ibn Omar, for example, is a son of Omar, Abdullah bin Omar. That is a a true laqab, but you can also have a nickname such as Abu Hafs given to Omar because of his bravery and his great ability during a battle. And Omar bin Khattab was given this laqab due to his courage and strength on the battlefield. It was mentioned and it was narrated that he would be able to get on a horse without even 
leaning on anything, just simply grabbing the mane and be able to, with his strength and get on the horse itself. An amazing ability among the other great abilities that Omar bin Khattab had. Radu'an. And Amir al-Mu'mineen was the title given to him after or when Omar bin Khattab became the Khalifa because it was very worthy to be Khalifa to Khalifa to Rasulillah, which would be the actual title because Omar bin Khattab would be the Khalifa after the Khalifa to Rasulillah, which would be Abu Bakr. Radian. And it's suggested by one Sahabi that he would be called Amir al-Mu'mineen and this was basically the fitting title and has been the title of many Imams as well. For example, Imam Bukhari is Amirul Mu'mineen of the Muhaddideen, for example. Okay. Anyway, uh, let's go further into discussing the great life of this giant, which is Omar bin Khattab. And we can basically spend this whole lecture, this whole lesson on Omar bin Khattab and still not give him justice. One of the great unique things about this man who the Prophet says said about him that if there was to be a prophet after me it would be Umar bin Khattab Radan. and one unique thing about him was that there were more than 12 times when the opinion of Omar conformed to revelation meaning that he had an opinion about something and he spoke about it and then shortly afterwards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed an ayah or a surah in concordance with his opinion. Some examples of this are number one, Maqam Ibrahim as a place of prayer. Then there was a time when uh, Omar bin Khattab was deadly against or very against after the battle of Badr to have POWs. He actually voted that they should be killed because the back of Kufr had to be taken out. And this was his opinion of Omar bin Khattab that the POWs after the Battle of Badr should be executed. But based on Ijtihad, they basically were ransomed. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the surah and ayat in favor of the opinion of Umar bin Khattab. Then there was a time during the time of the Hadith al-Ifq, the incident of Ifq against Aisha radi anha, when the Prophet made mashwara with the Sahaba regarding Aisha. Omar bin Khattab asks the Prophet ﷺ, who has made your nikah to her, O Rasulullah? And the Rasulullah ﷺ, of course, replied, Allah Ta'ala. Then Omar Rad'an said, do you think that your Lord deceived you on that? Subhanallah, glory be to you, O Allah. This is a great lie. And Surah Nur, Ayah 16, confirmed that, and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala revealed the exact words. Now, another title regarding Omar bin Khattab was al Farooq. And this is another unique aspect of Umar bin Khattab, his tenacity for the truth and sticking to it. And an example of his justice, and there are many examples of his great justice, is in his death when he died as a shaheed. It was interesting that he made a dua that make me a shaheed, but also make me die in the city of Medina. And Allah Azawajal accepted both. And it's amazing because at that time, I mean, the Muslim empire was the strongest in the world. And who would be able to kill Omar in Medina, in the stronghold, in the center and capital of the Muslim Ummah? But yet it was his fate. There was a, a jealous Persian slave by the name of Abu Lu'lu. And during the time of the Fajr Salah, when it was very dark, he was stabbed because the Muslim Ummah had sacked Persia and basically put it down. Okay, Had defeated the Persian Empire and that made him very jealous, and that was a cause of stabbing him, Omar bin Khattab, along with killing many other Sahaba or several other Sahaba during the Fajr Salah. After the stabbing, Omar bin Khattab was given milk and it began to pour from his abdomen, and that's when he knew that he was going to die. And just before his death, he asked his son Abdullah bin Omar to ask Aisha, to ask Aisha to be buried with his two friends. And Aisha, and this is of course the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr Radan. And Aisha said that she was always looking forward to being buried with her husband ﷺ, and also next to her father. But at this time, this moment, she realized his greatness and his strength. And she gave him permission. She gave him permission to be buried next to the Prophet ﷺ and next to Abu Bakr. 
But because of his justness, that wasn't enough for Umar. He told Abdullah bin Umar, his son, to ask Aisha after my death again. He said, Aisha, after my death again, ask her. Perhaps she gave me permission since I am the Khalifa. At the age when the Rasul and Abu Bakr Radan passed away at the age of 63, he also passed at the same age. Again, unparalleled justice and fairness. We can go an hour about how Omar benefited the Umar or more. His leadership roles. I mean, how he was a great and just leader. Unfortunately, if you look towards us, the leadership roles which are filled by Muslims, even if they be you know, just people or good people, often it's filled with favoritism, nepotism, tribalism, racism, little regard for justice or taqwa. But if you look to Omar, unparalleled, unparalleled, he basically crushed nepotism. And this is a lesson for all of us, inshallah, as we are you know, leaders within certain contexts in our, in our family, in our community, you know. So it's very important to be just because this is commanded by Allah Azawajal. Other things which Umar bin Khattab did as well. One other important thing that was done during his Khilafah was the development of the Hijri calendar. And we're, you know, benefiting from this very great decision. Because at the time, they were making treaties according to the Christian calendar. You're talking about when they were going into new territory, treaties were basically dated. And they were using the Christian calendar, which was actually, it's AD. AD stands for Anno Domini, which actually is a religious annotation regarding the year of our Lord. Ya'ni, the year of the Lord, which they believe as Jesus Christ, alayhi salam. And of course, they regarded him as the Son of God. And this is basically the year which they regarded Regard in terms of religious respect from a Christian slant, which again is against our deen. So this is important because the Hijri calendar, the decision was not to base it on the birth or the death of Rasulullah but based on Hijra. And this is when the Muslims first became an Ummah, united. When the Muslim Ummah had any power. And when they were able to implement laws, when they were able to uh, call out the adhan and do the uh, salah in congregation together without any fear, where there was the first time when they were able to do khutbah. Well, this represents a very important start from the Muslim Ummah and the Sahaba were in agreement that it should be according to the Hijra. And this is where we get the Hijri calendar. Because think about it. Our history is based on this calendar. If it was based upon the birth of Prophet Sallallahu it would be like, you know, like the Christian calendar. But it was based on the Hijra, and this is also important in the context of this hadith as well, which we'll go into in a few moments. Also, Umar bin Khattab was the first to organize an army who were paid, the first to make a police force also. Umar bin Khattab participated in walking the streets at night to ensure law and order. Okay, He was also the first to gather one jama'ah for the for the Tarawi Salah, and this of course has so much benefits and bounty. Think about if the Ramadan at night, if there were various Tarawi Salah, it would be chaos. So alhamdulillah, this was a great decision, and also in concordance with the Sunnah as well. Okay, now let's transition to looking at this great Hadith. And one thing about this Hadith which is important to mention, is that this Hadith is Ahad. And it's from the category of a gharib hadith, or a solitary narration from uh, which is sahih. Ya'ni, meaning one continuous narration which has no unbroken or weak links in terms of the narrators, and the matin of the hadith is also authentic. So this is an example of a hadith which is gharib, or ahad, a single appropriate narration, or sahih narration. And this is an example that Imam Bukhari put in this his sahih to also let others know that it's okay to include ahad narrations. Ahad narrations are accepted as a narration we can use in this deen because it's one, one continuous chain without any defect back to the Prophet ﷺ. Okay. And the opposite of ahad is mutawatir, which is numerous continuous chain. 
Okay, so the opposite really of mutawatir is ahad, but if the ahad hadith is sahih, it is something which we can use in, in our deen in terms of fiqh, in terms of judgments, etc. Okay. Now there are other sanad of this hadith, but they are either broken or incomplete. Now, collections of hadith are a reference point. Okay. We have, for example, the two authentic collections which are Bukhari Muslim. And the great thing about that and the really benefit for this ummah is that any hadith we get from Bukhari and Muslim which have been narrated in their books are sahih. So we don't have to worry about that. As opposed to other hadith collections and also the same for Muwatta Imam Malik, the hadith narrations which go all the way back to the Prophet, they're also similarly uh, basically almost 100% sahih. But other books, for example, Musa Ahmad, you have Ibn Majah, Abu Dawood, there are some narrations which are not authentic, meaning which can be da'if. Like for example, Ibn Majah, perhaps one-fifth or one-fourth of the narrations are touted to be da'if. But anyway, when you cite a hadith, it's very important to have a reference point in terms of where the hadith is located. So it's very important that for example, if you're in a khutbah or you're giving a dars, it's very important to have certain details about the hadith. Number one, the narrator, who's the sahabi who's narrating. That way the hadith and the chain can be identified. Number two is, where is the location of the hadith? Ya'ni, is it in Bukhari Muslim? Is it in Ibn Majah? Is it in Muslim Ahmad? Is it in Muwatta Malik? So those are important. For example, not every collection of hadith necessarily is a reference point. For example, you can't say that, okay, I got this hadith from Riyadh Salihin. Riyadh Salihin has hadith, but it's not a reference point for where the hadith are housed. Similarly, you can't say, or it's not proper to say that, okay, I got this collection from the 50 hadith of Jami al al-Hikam from uh, Imam Rajab or Arbayin Nawawi, even though now we collected these hadith, it's not a reference point. The reference points are, for example, the Sahih Sitta and others such as, uh, it could be Ahmad, it could be, it could be Muwatta Malik, it could be Darqutni, it could be Bayhaqi. There's more collections of hadith than just the Sahih Sitta. The Sahih Sitta basically would be Bukhari Muslim, Tirmidhi, Abu Dawood, Ibn Majah, and An-Nasai. Those are the Sahih Sitta. Anyway, inshallah, we'll talk more when the time is suitable. So, altogether, when using a hadith, you should know it's narrated as habi. The matan, of course, for example, innama la'amalu binyat wa innama likullimrin manawa, and so on. And the source, which is, in this case, Bukhari and Muslim, which is also referred to as mutafaqqan alay. Whenever you hear that, it's basically Bukhari and Muslim. And it's also preferable to know its status. So, if you're, for example, narrating a hadith from Bukhari Muslim, you know they're sahih, so that's not an issue. But if you're narrating from any other book, such as Ibn Majah, it's extremely important that you try to know its narration, whether it's da'if or sahih or hasan. Hasan is a similar status, basically sahih, but a lower grade. But we'll talk more about this, inshallah. But one thing to remember is transmission of hadith. This is an amana. And this is an amana from the Prophet ﷺ. And it's important that we be true and we not be lazy in terms of our transmission of hadith and not be lackadaisical and just make assumptions because if we're not sure, if we're not sure if it's coming from a book, then we have to verify, we have to do research on it. If you don't know, you don't know. And it's very unfortunate, it's very commonplace that many, many daif hadith are transmitted in our communities, in our massages, and even many uh, fabricated hadith. For example, in, there was um, a young brother who was giving a little dars, and at the end he basically quoted a quote-unquote hadith, and he mentioned that something like, make 70 excuses for your brother. And this is a strange saying which I never heard before, not that I'm a muhaddith or any expert in hadith, but I asked him where his source was, and he said, oh, well, my sheikh, he even narrated this hadith is definitely authentic, you know, it's sahih. And he wasn't able to give me a specific book and other information regarding this hadith. And so I did my own research. And it's not that simple because you have to basically go back to the matan in Arabic and research it. So with the little Arabic that I knew, I tracked it down to a saying of a scholar. But anyway, uh, the point is that this, this brother actually unintentionally did something which may be considered by others to be a major sin. 
and also not only that, give the community a false saying attributed to the Prophet ﷺ. The reason I bring this up is that as we're discussing hadith, what is the most mutawatir hadith? Where the Prophet ﷺ says, Man kadaba alayya mutaammidan falyatabawa maqadahu minan nar. Prophet ﷺ says, Whoever lies against me intentionally, then let him take his seat in the hellfire. And in general, most of the Sahaba knew this hadith, and this actually scared some of them not to narrate hadith. Well, this is very important, and some of the narrations actually of this hadith are without غير mutaammidan. Ya'ni, whoever narrates against me, and the, the word mutaammid is not mentioned, then let him take فَلْيَتَبَوَّ مَقَدَهُ مِنَ النَّارِ and this is even more scary because now this is mentioning that anyone who, period, lies against the Prophet, and there may be implication even unintentionally, then let him take his place in hellfire. But the uh, more more right meaning is muta'amidan, because you know, we're, as human beings, we can make mistakes. Okay, but we have to make the proper effort. Finally, the shot of this hadith. Okay, so it starts with. إِنَّمَا لَأْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ And this innama is a phrase which includes hasr, confinement or exclusiveness. Here the Prophet ﷺ starts with innama and confines actions to their respective intention. Okay? So the meaning therefore is actions are exclusively by intention. Okay? The meaning... This meaning is better than, for example, actions are by intention. Actions are only or exclusively by intention. That's where we get innama only. Now, this can be a little lengthy in terms of the even more precise meaning. Okay, there are two different opinions regarding what this means. Okay, as per Sheikh Shankriti, rahimallah, who passed away in 1972, a Christian era. The sentence in Arabic, إِنَّمَا لَأْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ is a jumla ismiya and it has within it, as its khabar, shuba jumla. I apologize for the grammatical terminology, but this is important in terms of its overall shar. And a shuba jumla basically has an implied word in it. And it's referred to by grammarians as a kain. And a kain is basically an implied word. So for example, if I were to say, Zaydun fid dar or Zaydun fil bayt. Zayd is in the house. The Arabic would be Zayd fil bayt in the house. So Zayd would be Zayd is present in the house. So Zayd mawjudun fil bayt. So the kind of fil bayt, which is a shuba jumla, would be mawjudun or mawjudan. Okay? So this is an example of kain. So often you have this implied word, and often it's, it's understood by context. And the scholars, in terms of this hadith, one opinion is that it's this elliptical or this implied word, this kain is makbulan, makbul, accepted. So actions are only accepted by intention. Okay. The ba is also it's a harf, it's a particle of sababiya, a particle of reason, giving it the reason for some things. This is a'mal. The actions are because of niyat. Okay, so the proper meaning is actions are only by intention. But there's a second opinion. This is the Hanafi madhab. They ascribe a more literal meaning to this statement. They occur by intention. Okay, but this is more literal instead of using an implied word. But nonetheless, regardless of which meaning is used, there is no action except that there is an intention with it. So all actions have intentions, whether the action is a good one or a bad one. And whether the action is accepted by Allah or not, every action is performed due to an intention behind it. So for example, if someone is doing a religious activity, action such as salah, without any intention whatsoever, like a robot, just following the ritual that his parents used to do with no intention, doesn't even know that he's praying in front of Allah, is thinking about other things, zero attention, zero khushu, then this is his intention. Another, for example, is someone taking a shower, which technically may count as ghusl or wudu, 
but he's only doing it for only solely to cool himself. Right? With that, that intention, use this also for wudu or ghusl, which may count for religious activity, then it would not be counted. In the Hanafi mother, there's also different ikhtilaf regarding that. Another better example, perhaps, and more clear example is if someone's praying salah to please his parents. Where if his parents were not there, he would not pray or never pray. So then in this case, then his prayer is not counted because he is doing it to please someone or to be seen. Okay, And this is exactly what is very important regarding doing actions or ibadat for an attention other than Allah. Regardless of which opinion, both opinions would be sahih or okay. The, the most important matter is what is your attention. And every action has an intention and the whole point is whether it's going to be accepted or not. It's important to note that the place of action is the heart. It is not the tongue. In other words, you do not need to state your intention to do something. Okay? You don't have to say, okay, I am praying Salatul Asr at this time in front of the Kaaba. And Abdullah Sayyid, age of 42, weighing 160 pounds. I mean, this is not needed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows your intention. As long as you have that in your heart or mind, it is there. It becomes done. You don't have to overstate that. Now, if there's a, a lot of noise around and you, you want to try to focus on your prayer, focus on what you're doing, regather yourself to remind yourself what you're doing, perhaps this is okay. But to do this continuously, then it's not something which is sanctioned by the Prophet ﷺ and actually is something we should avoid because it can become a bid'ah, something which is an innovation. Then there's another hadith which is important also, I think, which goes in line with this hadith uh, regarding niyyah. So hadith actually is from hadith 37 in this collection. Where Rasulullah says, Inna Allah katab al hasanati wa sayyi'at, thumma bayyinna dalik, fa man hamma bi hasanatin falam ya'amalha, katabaha Allahu indahu hasanatan kamila. Rasulullah says, and this is actually hadith Qudsi, that indeed Allah, He has written, the good deeds and the bad deeds then has clarified them. Then the one who has hum to do a good deed, has an intention, a strong intention or intention to do this, a good deed, but is not able to do it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will write for him a complete good deed. وَإِنْ حَمَّ بِهَا فَعَمَلِهَا قَتَبَهَ اللَّهُ عِنْدَهُ عَشَرَةَ حَسَنَاتِ Then, if he does that good deed, Allah subhanahu will write it as ten Good deeds, mashallah, beautiful hadith as well. And that's not the complete version, that's just basically the first part. The point here is there are different words to niyat or niya, and one is ham, which basically refers to intention coupled with determination, i.e., a strong intention. And it's important also that ham, we should have ham of good deeds as much as possible because when we really strive to do something, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards us as if He had done the good deed. So for example, we had strong intention to pray this Fajr Salah in the masjid or strong intention to do the, the Hajj that night. You set your alarm, you asked someone to even wake you up, but it just didn't manifest. Inshallah, you will get that as a single reward. And if you actually do it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will write it as 10 good deeds, mashallah. A win-win situation. Okay, And this is ham, this is niyat. So even if you are not able to fulfill the action, if there is the hum, then inshallah you will get the reward. However, on the other side of the coin, it's important to avoid the hum of sins. Because this is where we can actually earn a sin without doing it. Okay. All around us, we're basically surrounded by fahisha, surrounded by evil things which stir our hearts to be attracted to the evil. And shaitan wants you to fantasize about fahisha, about evil things. So you have a hum for it, a strong desire. And when you have a strong desire, then you may fall into being or wanting to act on it. And this can become a sin. Just also want to refer you to one hadith where the Prophet said, mean, this is authentic, where I'm going to paraphrase it. When two Muslims meet with their swords, then the killer and the killed are in hellfire. And the Sahaba asked the Prophet ﷺ, yes, we understand why the killer would be in the hellfire, but what about the one who was killed? And the Prophet ﷺ said that he was very eager to also kill his brother. 
So those two, those two Muslims were fighting with their swords, right? Both of them had the hum to kill each other, and they basically acted on it. The, both had the swords, both acted on it, but one was able to kill the other. Both get the evil or the sin of the hum, and the one obviously who killed or the killer gets more, but the other one also gets his place in hellfire because of his determination to do evil. The point is we have to, as much as possible, avoid hum because it can lead to evil. And then we have azm, which is even more stronger than hum. For example, the Ulul Azm, the, the great prophets, the great messengers such as Nuh, Muhammad, Sallam, Isa, Ibrahim, and Nuh, alayhim salam. And also with this hadith, it's important also that if your niyyah is very strong, then you will get also an appropriate reward in sync with your niyyah. We have the example, the famous example of a prostitute who saw that there was a dog near a well and who was very thirsty. And she, because she had a great intention, niyyah, to do something for the sake of Allah, just that one action, so much iman in it, so much sincerity, that Allah Azza wa Jal forgave her. A person who was in a life of prostitution, a life of major sin, and here Allah Azza wa Jal for one action which she did sincerely for the sake of Allah, forgave her sins. And this is an example also that we should couple our niyyah and make it with a powerful intention. Increase our iman when we do good deeds, inshallah, and it will increase the amount of reward and increase the level of the action. Intention also does not refer to a mere fleeting thought of doing something. For example, someone encourages you to like memorize the Quran and you have a mere thought of it and you agree that's a good thing. You know, I would like to memorize the Quran, inshallah, then I would get so much barakah and I, perhaps maybe I would go into Jannah. But if it's just a mere thought where you didn't ponder much or act on it much, then it doesn't qualify as a hum. It doesn't really qualify as a niyyah. And thus, it doesn't really count. Okay, So we have to try to for the good actions, not just have a mere fleeting thought. So there are three categories of thoughts that come into the mind and the heart in which a person is not liable for a sin. A fleeting thought that comes for an instant and leaves is termed hajjiz. The thought which is considered or contemplated is called a khatir. And this can include whispering or waswas from an evil source such as shaitan. So shaitan tries to do waswas, but as long as we don't act on it or this increases to the level where it becomes a hum, then we're not liable for this. But we have to obviously seek the refuge from the shaitan, from his waswas and the waswas of his companions from mankind. Similarly, there is hadith nafs and this is basically a more deeper thing than waswas or khatir or hajiz. And this is less than hum. But now there is more deeper level of thought. And this is hadith nafs The sub does not, the nafs does not incur a sin for these three levels of thought. A'mal, actions. Okay. Actions are those things which are willfully done. And also refers to actions which are more continual. It's not like af'al. Af'al are basically actions which don't have any spiritual connection. Like breathing. Breathing we always do, every human being breathes, but it's not something which we're going to get good or bad, uh, bad deeds from. Okay? Or for example, an action which is forced. Many times actions which we do, just as human beings, like eating, going to the bathroom, sleeping, often they don't have a uh, sin or good ascribed to them. Of course we can make them good, inshallah, if we have a dua, if we do the action in concordance with the sunnah. If, for example, you say the basmala before we're eating, inshallah, then the action will become a good deed. However, in general, they're not really counted. We're talking about ibadat. So, af'al in general, ya'ni ibadat. Okay. So, it's not just the physical also actions of limbs, but also can refer to the speech of the heart. Okay, Speech as well. Actions of the heart. So, they're also a'mal. So included in the word a'mal are, is everything that is connected with one's iman. So a'mal is not just separate from iman. Okay? It's continuous. It's basically the external version of your iman. Okay? And it's important that many Muslims claim that they have 
great iman, they're very righteous and they're very sincere, but do no amal whatsoever. And this is actually a reflection of their weak and limited and narrow iman. So, iman must necessitate actions. An example of this also, perhaps, is from Imam Bukhari has a beautiful collection of a hadith and in the first chapter, he gives the example of Heraclius that he knew he had the knowledge of the deen, but he did not act on it. And thus he had an evil death. Okay, it's a long, beautiful hadith, but there's purpose in Imam Bukhari putting these hadith to make a point. So anyway, amal has everything to do with one's iman. It's very important. Okay. Then we continue with the hadith. وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مْرِنْ مَا نَوَى and everyone, everyone will only have that what he intends. Okay. Again, we see hasar with innama. Okay. One important point to note is that a nice equation for the weight of a good deed, because obviously all of us are inshallah striving for good deeds. At the end of the day, we have to try to gather the good deeds at the end of the day, right? It's not just about earning the money, but it's also earning the good deeds. Okay. And the weight of a good deed, a nice formula, is it's the action itself, such as basically the prayer, whether it's sadaqah, whether it's psalm, dhikr, times the iman. And this is where niyyah has great effect. It multiplies the weight of the action. It is also uh, for us to be as sincere as possible. For that prostitute who fed the dog with great iman and niyyah, look at what happened. A life of sin erased in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put her in paradise just for that action. So an example, a nice example of the power of Iman. How it elevates our actions. Let's go forward. Okay. And this hadith then talks about then فَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ And then talks about hijra. Meaning is migration. Means leaving and avoiding. The hijra in this hadith actually is the al-hijra. Okay. The migration from a land of shirk to a land of Islam, which at that time was commanded on every believer. And the context of this hadith actually being spoken by the Prophet ﷺ is it happened at a time when a man migrated from Makkah to Medina during the hijra for the sake of marrying a woman. This Sahabi actually did not migrate for the Hijra as a command, but migrated because the person that he wanted to marry was also doing Hijra. And she only was going to agree to marry on the condition that he also migrated. So he migrated actually for the purpose of marriage. And the Prophet became aware of this. And this is a great example for all of us uh, to this day to purify our intention. Any intention done for other than sake of Allah becomes Baapil becomes unaccepted. Here also, this hadith shows us a teaching methodology of the Prophet ﷺ, which is to explain a principle, explain an abstract principle by an example. Okay, And this is a beautiful thing we see in the hadith again and again. In this hadith, Rasulullah ﷺ gives us three practical examples. And examples help illustrate the principle so that it's easier for people to understand and apply. These three examples consist of one, a good intention, for example, migration for the sake of Allah and His Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And two, two inferior intentions. For example, migration for the sake of worldly gains or marriage. And here again, and also this hadith denotes the eloquence of the Prophet Again, بُعِتُّ بِجَمَامِ الْكَلِمْ Here the Prophet says, وَمَنْ كَانَ هِجْرَةُ لِدُنْيَا يُسِيبُهَا أَوْ إِمْرَاتٍ يَنْكِحُهَا فَهِجْرَتَهُ إِلَى مَا حَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِ and then his hijra is for that which he migrated for. So here the, in the eloquence of the Prophet ﷺ, he mentions the uh, commendable hijra, which is then his hijra is for Allah and his messenger. And for the hijra which is for the dunya, it's not even worthy of its mention. And basically Rasulullah did not even give it importance. And this is again eloquence from the Prophet ﷺ. Additional points. Okay. Imam Shafi rahimullah Consider this hadith, one-third of the knowledge of Islam related to over 70 topics of fiqh. Okay, so this hadith is 
considered to be one of the greatest hadith in Islam and perhaps by many to be the greatest hadith because of its importance and the fact that we should start with our niyat because if our niyat is not for Allah then it becomes batil. It the whole great thing you do for example in the case of this sahabi which he earned the name Hajir Um Qais the one who migrated for Um Qais which is the, the sahabiya who he wanted to marry that became his title not the title you would want and Hijrah was a huge thing you leave everything you leave your possession your home your family for Allah and his messenger okay huge deal huge sacrifice for and that's why basically the muhajireen had this title of Hijrah with them they're the ones who left everything for for Allah and his messenger okay so there's many lessons even with this word of Hijrah that we can learn from and also it's a reflection for us where is our hijrah because we're all also in a hijrah to one of two destinations either above or below are we going to be stuck to the earth and go below ma'adullah into the pit or are we going to elevate ourselves inshallah and be accepted by Allah through his forgiveness and his mercy into Jannah Amin. so other important lessons from this hadith number one ikhlas or sincerity we already talked a little bit about this. Sincerity of Allah Azza wa Jal. This is to be truthful and honest with Allah. Performing an act solely and only for His sake. And then whereas no other thing or entity is sought as the reason for the ibadah. It is the major condition for acceptance of good deeds. This hadith is therefore a criteria to help Muslims Evaluate and judge what they do and what they say as an ibadah in their lives. The other condition, however, in addition to intention, is that actions must be done in accordance with the sunnah. And this is basically hadith, hadith 5. Man ahdata min amrina hada ma laysa min fahuwa rad. The hadith, which was narrated by Aisha radiallahu anh, which is extremely important condition and a criteria of actions this goes hand in hand with niyyah or intention because it is not enough to have the right intention for example one can say let me pray for raka of fajr to earn more reward instead of two raka this would logically make more sense however this would not be accepted because never did the Prophet ever sanction this okay his was of course only two raka that's fixed and this is basically part of the sincerity and submission to the haqq as laid down by Allah and His Messenger. It's to say, to invent another matter, to do something which is not in accordance, to be indirectly saying that I have a better way than Allah and His Messenger, Ma'adullah. And the interdependence of these two conditions, ikhlas, sincerity, and also the sunnah, is also illustrated in the shahada, the declaration of faith. Its first statement, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, is ikhlas, ensuring that our actions are for the sake of Allah alone. Okay, so that's the first part of the kalima. The second part, Ashhadu anna Muhammad ar Rasulullah. I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, is the sunnah. So here we see with the shahada, the first pillar of Islam, these two factors, the ikhlas and also the sunnah in accordance to the, the way laid down by the Prophet ﷺ. Ibadah should be done only for the sake of Allah جل, as He is the only one worthy of worship. Because we only do ibadah for, uh, for religious purposes, you know, for this is for our God, for Allah, the only one and true God. Now, where is this violated? Well, there are some examples. For example, some converts proclaim the shahada for worldly reasons such as marriage. And this is not uncommon, you know, where someone would, you have two, a Muslim who's marrying another person who's not Muslim, and because of family reasons, the Muslim requires that the other partner, or their fiancé or whatnot, right, and often this is through a haram relationship anyway, convert to Islam before they get married, because it's going to be problematic for the family, the family is going to reject the, the whole marriage, okay, and the person who's converting apparently just does it only on the tongue and how can you determine this well it's very plain and simple if they're not praying prayer is a consequence of truly accepting the shahada if there's a person who claims the 
who says the shahada and never has prayed, right? Their testimony of shahada was just fraud. It was just, just a lie, really. It was just for that worldly reason for marriage, for example. Okay. So this is important, obviously. But there's many other examples as well. Okay. So following the Prophet's sunnah in our ibadah, our akhlaq, ethics, our dealings, ensures that we are doing things in accordance with the sharia. While we're at it, we can also define what the sunnah is. What is the sunnah? Because it's important to know the specific definition because we're looking at hadith. Is a hadith the same as a sunnah? No, there are distinctions and it's important, particularly since we are studying our hadith. The definition of sunnah is or are the sayings, actions, and affirmations of the Prophet ﷺ, which are in turn are the manifestations of the Quran itself. But this is basically what the sunnah is. The legal injunctions which have been laid down by the Prophet ﷺ regarding our deen and also what is commendable and the opposite, things which are liable for sin. This is the sunnah. Okay. The hadith are the written account of the sayings, actions, and affirmations of the Prophet ﷺ including other details which may or may not constitute the sunnah. Every hadith has a text with a chain of narration. So you have a hadith which is composed of the matan, which is the text, and the sunnah, which is the chain. And that's basically the written account of the Prophet And some of this may not necessarily be the sunnah. You know, for example, in general, the sunnah is to uh, sit down and drink water. Um, in general. So to say basically that the sunnah is to stand would not necessarily be correct. I mean, there have been occasions where the Prophet ﷺ did stand, but often this was to show that it's not a must. Okay, this is basically just defining something which is afdal versus something which is allowable. That's the definition of sunnah versus hadith. Okay, the hadith that we constitute the the basis of the sunnah really is from hadith, but it's not just one hadith. We have to take various hadith on a certain action or a certain topic. So if you take a specific hadith, it doesn't necessarily point to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ because the hadith could be on a specific personal attribute of the Prophet ﷺ. It could be uh, something which not necessarily is the sunnah of the Prophet which the Prophet may have done without a religious context. Okay, So it's important to make that distinction because not every hadith supports a sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Okay? But the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is based on the pillar of it really is based on a hadith and of course hadith go in conjunction with the Quran. Now checking niyyah. Okay, there's various ways in which we can gain or increase our class, and these include the following. Imam Ahmad said that before you do anything check your niyyah. Ask yourself before performing the action is this for the sake of Allah? Seeking knowledge. This is very important and this is also one of the purposes that we are here as well to seek the knowledge of Allah and His Messenger. Prior to doing a deed, we should seek ilm or knowledge. And our deeds and actions should be based on knowledge to make sure that we are doing things in accordance with the Sharia. Okay. The next thing is to increase in righteous deeds. The more good deeds that we do, the closer we will be to Allah. And inshallah, this will also increase our sincerity and also increase our Iman. And it will also enhance our Islam. Okay? You have to understand that there is a direct connection between Iman and also Islam. Islam is the outer, the result of Iman and vice versa. Islam or Islam goes back to the inner and builds on that. Higher level Iman leads to more Islam. Uh, more actions go back and further bolster Iman. So it's basically a direct relationship. Okay? Very important. And we'll see that also emphasize in the next hadith, hadith Jibreel, next session. Next thing is it's important, one way we can enhance our ikhlas is by uh, being sincere and avoiding false impressions. We need to do things only for Allah's sake. If we're trying to increase our ibadat and make it look pretty for others, this is actually for Maria or showing off. A good litmus test for our ibadat is to perform that ibadat the same degree when we're doing it in secret versus, in, for example, in the masajid. 
Okay? And the beautiful thing about the Sunnah is that there are things which the Prophet did openly, like the Fard Salah, and, and he would pray the, the Sunnah at home, the Sunnah Salah at home. And this is a good example for us also to follow. Like for Fajr Salah, pray the two raka of Fajr at home, the Sunnah, right? It's very important. And then you go towards the Masjid for to catch the Fard. Okay? And this way, when we do the even for the Sunnah, it will check ourselves, check our niyat, and everything will inshallah work out, and just things will just work out, you know, nice balance, and we'll just be going higher in terms of our ibadat, actions, iman, etc. So lessons from this hadith, preserving ikhlas. There's four things that we need to do which directly negate ikhlas. The first thing is, number one, the big sin, which is shirk. Because Allah subhanahu wa says, many times in the Quran, لا تشرك بالله Avoid shirk at all costs. Anything which looks shirky, avoid it. Because we're all limited in terms of our knowledge. And some things may look a little shirky. And we just have to avoid it. If it goes against our, our sense of wrong, our fitrah, which Allah Azza endowed us with, just be careful, take a step back, and you can always avoid it until you get more knowledge. The second thing is hypocrisy or nifaq. This is very important, and this is one major reason why uh, our sincerity is attacked and ruined because of hypocrisy. Okay. We cannot have double standards. We have to practice what we preach, and that's also a very common cause of nifaq. Okay, to be a hypocrite, to pretend to do something while we're doing it for other than the sake of Allah Azawajal. And it could be for many different reasons. So nifaq is very important essential to avoid. The third negator of a class is similar to nifaq, riyah. Okay. And this is performing an ibadah with the intention of showing off to others. And remember, the litmus test for this is to do the same action in public as you do in private. If it's similar and equal, then you're good, inshallah. But if your salah is suddenly twice as long in the masjid, there may be a problem. Okay. So Imam al-Harawi says that the root cause of insincerity is desire or hava. And this is related to a few of these following factors, such as making oneself appear better for others, or good to others. To avoid being blamed by others. For example, to pray so that you can avoid criticism of others, such as your spouse or family member, like your parents. To seek the glory of others so that people can praise you. Oh, this brother prays all the time. You know, he gives so much charity. And you're basically doing it so that people can say good things about you. To seek the wealth, money, or assistance of others. For example, and this is relatively common in the Muslim world. You know, you have someone who has a big beard, not because he uh, fears Allah or loves the Sunnah, but because he needs to increase his business to the Muslim community. So that they can recognize him as sincere. Okay, to be a quote-unquote good Muslim, to earn business contract. The last one is ma'asiyah. And this is very important as well. So we have shirk, we have nifaq, we have riyah. And when Riyah fits into what Imam al-Harawi is mentioning as well, in terms of desire. And the last is ma'asiyah, or committing sins, which decreases our insincerity. So whenever we do a sin, it, there's an effect on the heart, a black dot goes on our heart, and it decreases our iman. Okay? And thus, that ramifications are decreasing our sincerity. On the contrary, good deeds do the opposite, and enhance it. So that relationship between iman and Islam... The more Islam we do, the more Iman is going to be increased and vice versa. While the less Islam we do, the less outer actions we do, then it's going to affect our Iman and our sincerity automatically. Additional lessons as continuing from this hadith. Ibn al-Qayyim, the famous scholar, says that any action we do can be defective for three reasons. Okay. Number one, being conscious that others are observing the action. So if we, for example, arrive early for the salah in the masjid before the imam or in the first saf, we should steer away from thinking, for example, that we are better than others. We should rather praise Allah Azza wa Jal, for enabling us to go to the masjid and be able to perform the salah on time with difficulty so that we were in the first row or in the first rank. Number two, seeking a worldly return for the action. 
And this is also like we discussed this also playing the uh, role of a good Muslim for another reason other than Allah. Number three, being satisfied with the action. This also makes our regular actions more better or fortifies them. Okay, for example, after every salah, we should be self-critical and tell ourselves that we could have performed a better salah in a better way. In this way, we don't we prevent ourselves from self-praise and also allow us to be strategically better in the next salah. So there's several ways in which we can be sincere and thus gain ikhlas. And you know, we must always ensure that our actions do not deviate from ikhlas. There are several actions, however, which can automatically be regarded as being done with good intention. For example, ibadah in secret, qiyam al-layl, dhikr, right? dhikr on the tongue where other people don't perceive that you are doing dhikr, sadaqah, okay? the secret sadaqah, fasting, you know, the ones who are fasting typically in the true fast where no one knows that they're fasting. Da'wah, inviting others to Islam. And this, for the most part, is a good action because in order just to sell Islam, in a sense, you have to you have to have a sincere heart and you're doing it to the best of your ability because this is a deen. You know, this is something which it's hard to fake. Community service is also important as well. And particularly those services where people don't notice what you're doing. And seeking knowledge in Islam also, in general, is a, for the most part, an automatic good action because you're trying to learn more about the deen so you can strengthen yourself, give it to others as well, sadaqa jariya as well. So these are some things we can do to automatically increase our rank, inshallah, increase our iman because for the most part, intention is there. So in the Quran and Sunnah, there's two types of, or two categories of niyyah. Okay. The first niyyah is, for example, regarding ibadah, or the act of worship. So, for example, you have a person who is fasting outside Ramadan. Okay. He got sick, he missed a few fasts during Ramadan. But it's also the month of Shawwal. Okay. And he wants to do a fast of Shawwal, the sixth fast of Shawwal. So basically, is he fasting to make up that fast of Ramadan, which he missed, or is he doing a voluntary fast to enhance his reward, the sixth fast of Shawwal? And similarly, for example, the person who enters a masjid in the morning time at Fajr time, and then prays two rakah. Is he doing the two sunnah for the Fajr? Is he doing tahiyyatul masjid? Or is he doing the Fajr salah? Let's suppose he missed the, missed the fard, and he goes late, and uh, even though obviously the optimal is to do the tahiyyatul masjid, and then the sunnah, and then the fard. And then there's a niyyah towards the ma'bud, the one who is being worshipped. All or none again. This is basically the main gist of this hadith, which is talking about intentions for other than Allah. Intentions for Allah or other than Allah. It's all or none. Okay. Any action done for any other purpose gains a zero. Right? Actions are only by intention. Actions are only accepted by the proper niyyah. Okay. Now, another fiqh issue becomes combining intention. Can we do something with two intentions in mind? And this, on the surface, may appear to be incorrect. However, we see that Prophet has sometimes done things with two intentions in mind. How can that be so? Well, for example, Ibadah done for the sake of Allah, but also with the intention of teaching others. This does not diminish from the niyyah of the action. So we see an example with the Prophet ﷺ. When he ﷺ performed the Hajj for the sake of Allah, but also as a means to teach his companions the rites of Hajj. And there are actions which Allah and Muhammad ﷺ have encouraged by mentioning a poor the reward for them as being something in the dunya. Okay. For example, risk. And this is commonly cited hadith, which is narrated by Bukhari Muslim, where he says, the Prophet ﷺ, whoever would like his risk to be increased and his life to be extended, he should uphold the ties of kinship. So someone seeking to increase his life and his risk Make sure that he upholds the ties of kinship. Okay? Because it's something which the Prophet recommended okay, specifically. Another thing is 
fasting to decrease desire. And the Prophet ﷺ said, and this is narrated by Ibn Mas'ud and also in the collection of Bukhari, Prophet ﷺ said, O young men, whoever among you can afford to get married, you should do so. Let him do so. And whoever cannot afford it, let him fast, for that will be a shield for him. So here is an example of fasting to decrease desire as per the Prophet ﷺ advice to young men or young men who cannot get married due to inadequate means. Okay. Additional fiqih matters regarding niyat, our intentions. Okay. What if our niya changes while we are doing an action? Well, Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali rahimullah said that it's okay if the niya at the end of the action is equal to the niya before the action. Okay. So if, for example, our niya sort of strays a bit, we're losing focus, then we can shake it off and match the niya to uh, do something for the, for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. Okay. However, if we lose our niya, you know, for example, you start praying and then someone enters a masjid and now we're basically trying to beautify them with a salah more to please that person, whoever that may be, and uh, that's how we end the prayer, then we get nothing. Okay. But if we snap out of it, and realize that what am I doing? I'm, this is for Allah Zawajal, and we're busy focused, then inshallah our niya would be okay and Allah subhanahu will forgive us for that even if our niyas were straight in the middle. Okay, And these things happen day to day where so many distractions that we have, inshallah, and iman goes up and down, so we have to try to maintain it and be cognizant because there's so many forces of the shayateen, the dunya, etc. in our daily lives. So if the niyyah does change, we have to obviously seek sincere repentance and tawbah because then the deed gets a zero and in fact it may even be sinful. Remember, when we do things other than the sake of Allah, we actually earn sin because really it's something which is going towards shirk. Unintentional swearing is also an important topic as well or a topic we should know about, which is commonplace in certain Arab countries. In fact, sometimes it even becomes culture. Swearing by Allah unintentionally obviously is disliked and it's something we should definitely always steer away from because swearing is a big thing. Surah Al-Ma'idah, Ayat 89, Allah says, Allah will not impose blame upon you for what is meaningless in your oaths, but He will imp impose blame upon you for breaking what you intend of oaths. So you have to be careful. So its expiation is a feeding of 10 needy people from the average of that which you feed your own families or clothe them or the freeing of a slave. But whoever cannot af afford that, like freeing a slave or feeding 10 people, then a fast of three days is required. So breaking oath intentionally is a big thing, and it, it, this is something which requires uh, expiation. So as we're closing, let's look at the centrality of this first hadith. And this first hadith is central to Islam in many ways. Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, said, Islam is based on three principles. Number one, the actions of the heart. And these are the internal actions. Okay? For example, Iman, our connection with Allah, our belief in Allah. That's an action of the heart. Actions of the limbs are external actions, like the salah, the fasting, the sadaqah. Interactions between people are daily mu'amalat with people. Okay? To deal justly with others in our, for example, our business, to return the salam, to be nice and virtuous to our families. All these are mu'amalat. Okay. So here, the first principle is from this hadith. Now, this is one of the three major hadith which form the criteria for evaluating and judging action of ibadah. We mentioned that hadith 5 is the sunnah. Okay. So Imam Ahmad says, uh, Islam is based on three ahadith. Hadith number one, إِنَّ مَا الْأَمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Hadith number five, whoever introduces into this affair of others something that does not belong to it is to be rejected. مَنْ أَحْدَتَ مِنْ أَمْرِنَا هَذَا مَا لَيْسَ مِنْ فَهُوَ رَدْ Okay, that's the hadith. And hadith six, truly what is lawful is clear and what is unlawful is clear and in between the two are matters which are doubtful, which many people do not know. إِنَّ الْحَلَالَ بَيِّنْ وَإِنَّ الْحَرَامَ بَيِّنْ وَبَيْنَهُمَا أُمُورٌ مُشْتَبِهَاتٌ لَا يَعْلَمُهُنَّ 
Katiro Minanas. That's basically these six hadith which will, inshallah, go into as well. And in conclusion, this hadith is central to Islam in many ways, perhaps being the most important hadith in Islam. The message of the hadith is clear in that each action of ours is determined by our intention, whether it's good or bad. Therefore, and again, action meaning yani action of ibadah. Okay. Therefore, we should always check our intention. We must ensure that the action is done for the sake of Allah Azzawajal alone, so that it is accepted by Him and that we will be rewarded for it. Remember, if we do an action for other than Allah, then it's it's very liable for sin and sometimes major sin. Okay. Based on this sharh from this hadith, we should be able to answer the following questions. Okay. Number one, what is the significance and connection between the Quran and the Sunnah? Number two, what is the difference between the Sunnah and the Hadith? How should we transmit the Hadith to others? What is the value of Isnad in the religion of Islam? And again, this also encompasses the introduction lecture as well. What is the Arba'un of Imam Nawawi? What are three unique characteristics slash accomplishments of Imam Nawawi? Rahimullah. What are three unique characteristics and accomplishments of Umar? The narrative of this first Hadith. Hadith number one, write it down in Arabic from memory. This is very important. And subsequently and conversely and and also likewise, write down its literal translation from memory. Ten, give two things or name two things which corrupt our intention. Number eleven, give an example of an action that is accepted when the niyyah is for Allah and then for something else. Give an example of different niyat from a fiqhi perspective. And 13, how does this hadith exemplify a teaching methodology of the Prophet ﷺ? 14, what is an ahad or gharib hadith? And that is it. Jazakallah khairan for attention. I know a lot has been covered, but this is uh, very important, inshallah, and perhaps the nice first step into these grand and divine gems. Subhanaka Allahumma wa hamdik wa nashhadu wa la ilaha illa ant wa nasakfiqa wa tubu ilayka assalamu alaykum. ورحمة الله وبركاته